All right, uh, it seems that uh, we are now on the stage. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, um, SDS 2022. And this is our first proposed session. The title is Forget Data Analytics for Mobility, and we need it for accessibility. And as you can see from the stage, the organizers are here, including Monica, uh, Stefan, uh, Martin, and Alexandro. Uh, Monica, the stage is yours, and uh, you can start now. Okay, yeah. Welcome to our session. It's an honor to, to be here and uh, we hope that we can convey our ideas that we want to share with you during this session. Um, it is probably a little bit challenging, but hopefully that this, this will also trigger some interesting discussion with you. So what are we going to talk about? Um, if you are looking at uh, CO2 emissions and um, just focus on Germany for the time being, we see that there are different um, sectors that attribute to uh, CO2. And there is one sector, namely mobility, which has uh, around about 20%. And uh, the question is how to reduce that in order to achieve our climate goals. And uh, it is a consent that uh, only by technical solutions, uh, this will not be doable. So what we have to do is um, to change our mobility behavior, but also more fundamentally, probably also to change our mobility needs, uh, which trigger mobility. So, um, in general, uh, the question is, what uh, does this have to do with our uh, profession with spatial data science? In general, in the context of mobility, there are a lot of approaches that exploit our richly available data sources with data science methods and um, analyze it in order to achieve um, new insights. And what we are advocating with our um, session is that we should not only look at how to find new solutions, how to apply fancy algorithms um, like deep learning these days, uh, how to design interesting algorithms, but we should also think about um, what is the goal of it. Um, we should also take into account potential negative effects of our research. And uh, we should focus on the relevance of research and uh, on potential impact, especially with respect to climate change. So this will be our math, our message. And um, in order to structure our sessions, we have uh, the following plan. First, Alex is giving an impulse talk to, to bring you into to set, uh, set the screen. Then we have three short statements from the other organizers. Stefan will start. Then uh, we have a, a contribution of Martin, who unfortunately cannot be with us, but he recorded his contribution. And I will finish with uh, a short statement. And um, then we will have an open discussion with you. And uh, we count on you that uh, you will uh, join us in that discussion. And we have uh, possibly new insights also from your contributions. So now the, I give I sh I stop my screen sharing and give floor to Alex. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to to be here and to give a talk to this esteemed community, which I have to say I'm not part of, uh, not directly, uh, because um, my background, though I had some some uh, touching points with um, spatial data uh, during my studies of, of urban planning, um, I focused more on sociology and human factors afterwards, so I'm <clears throat> behavior uh, specialist and expert in mobility behavior and behavior uh, change processes. Um, and I'm since since a year or so also very closely working with climate uh, researchers. Uh, and it became more and more apparent to me that we need to change our perspectives. And this needs to be done not just uh, on a, on a pro uh, yeah, policy decision level, but even in research in different disciplines. I think that this uh, new perspective is not as present as it should be. And this is also uh, how I uh, more or less uh, captured Monica, Stefan, and, and uh, Martin at, a, at an event at a cinema where we met um, and found, uh, yeah, uh, new alliances to, to go out and uh, tell about this issue and what we need to focus on. Um, and that's also what I would like to share with you 
today uh, with a few slides from my side. So um, I'm a senior scientist at the AIT Australian Institute of Technology. I'm also uh, the, the MATIC group leader um, of the mobility group at ECTRI. And uh, yes, I work a lot with data scientists, uh, but um, I am from a little bit different perspective and that's, that may be also interesting for you. So um, as researchers in the area of traffic, uh, we have to deal with the issue that traffic is growing. We had just uh, during the pandemic, the, the traffic, uh, the, there was a, a little bit of, of reduction of traffic, but we are facing growing traffic again. And of course, this uh, goes along with several different challenges that we are working on for, for a couple of years already. <laughs> at least during my career, that's all, those are the, the challenges that we are dealing with. Uh, uh, traffic sa uh, traffic safe, safety, then uh, congestion, uh, pollution is a, is a big part, uh, either, ever growing more important. And uh, of course, not everybody has the same access to mobility. So, um, and so we work on, on new solutions, on new algorithms, on, on new um, solutions to uh, maybe reduce traffic or more, make it more environmentally friendly. Um, and we come up with, with ideas like self-driving cars, for example, uh, connected vehicles and, and so on. So, and this is, as I said, nothing new. We are not just working on these issues for the last 10 or 20 years. So this is, uh, has accompanied us for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, for example, there was a big conference uh, 98 were, were specialists, experts, uh, and policymakers from all around the world were coming to New York, uh, discussing in a in a, grad, uh, in a large conference these issues. It was a little bit of a scandal because uh, there were some uh, major, um, yeah, different different perspectives on how to deal with that. Um, not, not, I don't know if you heard about that. But uh, I would be surprised because it was uh, 18... 98 and uh, this was the the traffic that they were discussing so there was growing traffic in cities more and more horse carriages uh, it, the, 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 the streets were crowded they had the same issues then as we have today so there were accidents uh, there was a lot of traffic and not much room in the cities of course pollution was becoming an, a really great um, problem at the time and this was also uh, the, the birth of uh, uh, prognosis and uh, of logistics, not how to bring things to people, but to bring um, horse excrement out of the city. So, uh, and, and of course, not everybody had a horse carriage uh, or, or the, the same modes of transport. And that what they invented then was a self-driving car. So the automobile uh, with no horses um, and everybody was expecting then uh, of course, it's going to be better. It uses less room. Um, it's it's safer because humans are driving and not horses are going crazy there. Um, and pollution would not more be a problem. No, ho no horse uh, experiments anymore. And uh, of course, with uh, industrialization, everybody could afford a car. And we solved all the problems. Um, but somehow we didn't. So this was not the same. That was not the uh, the yeah the golden ticket to get out of all these problems. So um, and we're still trying to do it in the same way. We're making few new inventions and we're trying to optimize traffic. Uh, we're trying to uh, yeah make it safer and so on. But what we end up is actually more traffic, as as we usually do. So. What do we really need? Uh, what what are the the new developments that we're really needing, uh, and how can different disciplines in research contribute to that? Um, so, I would now like to turn to the to the actual true transport challenges that we are facing. And Monica already mentioned it, and she hinted in that way. Uh, it's it we we really have much bigger problems at the moment and we have very little time to face them. Um, we're talking about sustainability and, uh, and, and we're talking about more uh, efficient and, uh, and more environmental friendly transport and uh, there are basically three strategies to achieve that. One is efficiency, and we have done a lot in this respect. So we have made um, we have made engines more efficient. Uh, we are optimizing 
uh, routes, we are optimizing traffic, managing traffic, and so on. Uh, also consistency, it means that we use different um, different uh, energy sources uh, and uh, biofuels, for example, electric energy, electric cars. Um, and those are the main solutions strategies that we are using at the moment. There's a third strategy, which is su a sufficiency, which is actually reducing the amount of energy and uh, the place, uh, the space that we need uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the distances we travel and so on, um, trip avoidances and so on. We have not achieved that far. Uh, we have it on our list uh, for uh, more than 30 years already to reduce traffic, but we have not been successful so far. So this is um, one of the big challenges here. Uh, for example, efficiency has also failed due to human factors. Uh, while uh, we, we try to reduce and make things more efficient and so on, um, especially in transport, the the saved energy has been re, um, uh, reused into just to buy bigger cars. So this is also how we react as human beings to, to saved energy costs, for, for example. We use it to uh, afford bigger cars because it's a constant. Also, we use about 12 to 15 percent of our uh, disposable income for transport. So um, there's not much saving done here. So we need to, to follow different uh, challenges and uh, different different solutions. And the biggest challenge uh, at the moment is climate, climate change. Uh, there are two challenges coming along with that. One is uh, that it is getting more and more uncomfortable on this world. And uh, it's also, we also need to think about, first of all, how to mitigate uh, climate climate change uh, and the impacts of climate change to uh, be sure that we stay within the, the narrow budget of CO2 we can still afford to uh, to emit in the in the atmosphere. But how are people going to, to react to that? So will people move out of the cities because there are more and more uh, threats uh, in, in dying of heat in, in the future? Uh, will there be more commuter traffic with nicely uh, air-conditioned cars? Are people buying uh, air conditioning everywhere they, they go? Uh, and also, how is how are the climate impacts in, um, in, uh, affecting then our, our infrastructure? There will be more wildfires, more floodings, landslides, and so on. And also, transport um, um, connections will be um, more and more uh, endangered of, of failing due to such hazards. And uh, there's the issue of transport justice. This is something that we are aware of for, especially in our own societies. We know that not everybody has the same chances and we try to, uh, to make it uh, more uh, evenly dif distributed, provide more access to transport. This is also one of the ideas of, of self-driving cars, for example. So anybody who is too young or too old to drive their car, they could use a self-driving car. So this is the solution we are thinking about. But on the other hand, uh, if everybody is driving a car, then even if they don't have to drive themselves, uh, of course, this will uh, mean more energy used, more space used. Uh, and this is on the cost of the global south, for example. It is already, we're already living uh, on the, the, um, yeah, the resources from, from other parts of the world and especially uh, in, in, the, uh, in the global north, we are, uh, yeah, we have, tremendous footprints and we need to reduce them uh, and it's not just about global justice it is especially and and yeah mostly about generational generational justice because uh what we are doing at the moment and if we are not stop if we don't stop to do that uh the world uh for our children and grandchildren uh, might be unbearable and it's, it will not be a place uh, to live in anymore. And this is really a huge threat and climate scientists are uh, fully agreeing on that. Um, and I think that we should all, all uh, different disciplines and researchers should be aware of that and should put all our efforts into uh, avoiding this, this future and, and helping us to reduce CO2 emissions significantly. So, and we have very little time to do that. So what, what can we do? Um, of course, it is uh, this, those are huge challenges, but it is doable. So 
we need, but it it, it demands a, a paradigm shift, a, a true new perspective. For example, on mobility, it's not about being mobile. It's about, especially not being a motorized mobile, uh, but it's about accessibility. So not being dependent on any any form of motorized transport to get somewhere, but to bring things closer to people uh, to to enable them to reach them also without motorized form of transport. So we need to change from uh, how transport needs, how, how we have learned and grown up uh, to to understand transport needs, to, to be able to get any place, anywhere, anytime, and with any means of transport. So this is what we are expecting. This is what we think is freedom as well. But it's, of course, reducing the freedom uh, of people on, on, on in, the, in the global south, for example, and it's reducing significantly reducing the freedom of our own children. So I already mentioned sufficiency. Uh, that's the perspective we we should take. Um, how much transport uh, can we afford, uh, and how can we change also the circumstances and the, the spatial structure, so that we are not dependent on motorized transport, uh, for example, anymore and which trips are absolutely necessary. Of course, they should be still possible, but how can we reduce uh, the trips that are not necessary? And we did a, a thought experiment here in a, in a project in Austria where we calculated uh, the, the CO2 budget that we still have for transport in Austria. What would it mean if we were already on the, on the 1.2 um, a million tons uh, CO2 equivalents in Austria where we where we should go. Currently, we are at 22 million tons, but we should go within the next 15, 20 years to 1.2. So it's a reduction of over, uh, over 95%. Uh, if those, if, if we should already obey to this, this narrow budget, um, we could only travel uh, on average three kilometers with even with an electric car, um, powered by, by renewable energies. So this is the huge challenge that we are facing, and it is clear that we cannot maintain our current mobility behavior. So um, we also need to think about not just how much can we afford, but also what is needed. So we came also up with a new definition of min minimum mobility standards. But it turns out it's it's already possible. So we if we set new priorities, so we should focus on the location and having everything in uh, accessible distances. Uh, accessible means by, uh, by um, yeah, uh, 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 your own muscle power, so walking and cycling. If this is not possible, we can, th we can, sh uh, we can think about uh, solutions like digitalization, what we are doing right now, for example. We are meeting in the virtual space uh, instead of traveling all to one place uh, on the globe from different parts of the globe. And if this is not possible, if you cannot have it near you, if you cannot substitute it with virtual trips, then we need to think about uh, then and only then we need to think about transportation and then make it as environmentally friendly as possible. And only the last resort is uh, the car. So as I said, it is possible. We did some, uh, we, we did a, a very quick, um, uh, we developed a very um, yeah, rough tool uh, calculating what is where uh, this is already possible in the Greater Vienna distance, for example. Uh, it's a, it's a, a GIS tool, a, a GIS tool, very, very easy, easily done and with OpenStreetMap. So where it is, is it already possible to have 1,000 workplaces in walking distance and uh, shopping and education, everything that you actually need? Um, so it's possible already at a lot of places uh, and still we are traveling here and there and that. It is, it's an issue on the countryside, but not so much in urban spaces. So this is where we could already start and then think about how to improve the circumstances and spatial distributions, uh, distribution of, of uh, destinations in outside of the city. Okay, so what, what should we do? As a researcher, we should think about, does our research improve access, especially in the transport uh, uh, sectors, does our research improve accessibility? Or are we just trying to optimize motorized transport? This is 
as I already said, those those savings will be reinvested and it's not, not helping in any way. Does our research improve justice? Uh, not just ma making transport more accessible um, for, for people, uh, transportation disadvantage, but what about global justice? What about, so uh, what about generational justice? And does our research improve adaptation without risk risking mitigation? What I mean by that is we need, we need to, to meet the, the climate reduction goals, the CO2 reduction goals. That's, that's not negotiable. Uh, and we need to think about also what will be the climate impacts and how can we adapt to them. Uh, and this with the, the, uh, the CO2 budget that we actually have. So how can we use, reuse the CO2 uh, budget that we have for investing in, um, in solutions that will help us adapt, but not maintaining what we are doing right now. So this is my plea to do that. Uh, I thank you very much. Um, and I hope I, I, I could provide a, a slightly different perspective. And I'm very grateful for my colleagues who will follow now uh, and who are really data uh, anal uh, analytic uh, specialists and, and scientists uh, and break it down to this, uh, yeah, to this sector, which I cannot do that well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. That's now my turn. Let me turn on my slides. All right. Welcome, everybody from Australia. It's not late in the night. It's early evening, so it's still OK for me um, to talk and not to sleep um, during my talk. Um, I will um, take um, Alex's call for breaking down her message. You will see some words um, re-emphasized in my slides, but um, it will be an attempt to carve out what it means for spatial data science uh, when we talk, when we should talk about accessibility rather than mobility. Let me start with a couple of myths that are often coming up when discussion is about mobility and limiting mobility that seems to meet a, a nerve in the um, common mindset um, and is uh, driven by a couple of misunderstandings or misinterpretations of the facts. So one is mobility is an essential human need, therefore we can't cut back. Um, that's simply not true. Mobility is a derived human need, not an essential human need. Mobility is required to get access to opportunity. And the access to opportunity is an essential human need. So if we can manage to provide access to opportunity by other ways, then we don't need mobility or we don't need as much mobility as we had, have currently. Um, Alex mentioned one way, that is digitalization. Uh, many of you are working from home or have worked from home and have experience with that. Um, that's one way, but it's not necessarily the only way. We also can rethink our cities, for example, um, and, uh, and, and uh, become creative about the challenge to um, reduce mobility or increase access. The second myth on my list is limited mobility means social inequality. So we can't cut back because that would um, um, disadvantage some. And if I'm thinking of Melbourne's outer suburbs, that is certainly happening. Um, the outer suburbs are far from the city centre, uh, low developed with public transport, um, driving a car for people of lower social um, status is expensive um, and therefore they don't do it in two degrees that um, other people would do so then there is a relationship between um, the two but um, that is not necessarily so and can be thought differently um, again if we think about digitalization then we do see that um, even with limited mobility, one can have 
um, access or uh, people with uh, lower budgets can have access. Next one is transport growth is correlated with GDP growth. Uh, that has been historically the case, but you know that correlation is not causalization. Causal, yeah, that's correct. And uh, <clears throat> If we if we tackle the problem from another angle um, and by thinking cities differently, then there is so much to do, which again creates jobs, opportunities, um, growth in GDP, uh, just by that um, that we can easily give up on that statement. Last um, myth is mobility is freedom. True, but as Alex has said already, freedom is always relative to the needs of others. Uh, a sentence that we respect in many other ways, so we should respect it in the context of mobility as well. So, measures affecting personal mobility are touching on emotions, ethics and values as much as societal, environmental and economic sustainability, and that makes a discussion loaded and difficult, challenging. Still, we need to have it, as Alex has uh, put up the challenge to us. I'm citing here from a global roadmap of action towards sustainable mobility, um, a document that collects a range of um, suggestions um, from a current perspective. Um, among the challenges this document lists at the very beginning, uh, one of them um, is discarding policy measures to manage demand, phrased as a challenge. So it is discarded, it is often discarded uh, because it is deemed to be too difficult in the public debate for the reasons that were on my pre previous slide. And yet that is the point where we have to tackle the problem. Um, that document then goes on and advocates for a number of measures. I have highlighted in green what is relevant for uh, my argument here, uh, promoting a range of sharing measures, giving greater importance to accessibility rather than mobility, giving active travel greater priority, looking for safer and cleaner modes of transport and assessing travel times instead of speeds when measuring performance. Uh, one way of doing that is thinking of a 15-minute city, uh, an arbitrary, more or less arbitrary uh, measure uh, linked to what people do, are willing to, to do um, when they walk. Um, so this is um, the idea of having in reach, access to opportunity, in reach um, the daily necessities that can be accomplished by either walking or cycling from residence homes. Which brings up the question, um, what would a sustainable city or sustainable mobility look like? Um, there's of course the prominent um, um, definition of sustainability as or sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, if you translate that into the mobility space, then it becomes really complicated because uh, mobility is a derived demand. Uh, that means it has implications for many, many things. And therefore, any definition, there is no single agreed one, but any definition becomes complicated and a list of a number of items. Um, the last uh, dot point on this list is limit emissions and waste within the planet's ability to absorb them, etc. So there, there is the same thought of the UN's definition of sustainable development. But then it is also about access, accessibility, about equity, about uh, justice, in the words of Alex, etc., etc. So um, if you look at indices um, and then look only at, say, carbon emissions, um, then many of the things that we do in research are somehow limited. Um, one is optimizing existing mobility solutions, um, which, as my uh, 
uh, prior speakers have mentioned already is completely insufficient to bring us down to the levels that Alex has presented. Offsets um, are on top of that also inequitable. That means an offset on traveling hurts those that cannot afford it and is more or less without any impact on those who easily can afford them. So you can put offsets on air flights and the rich people will still fly. Um, um, if it is about an equilibrium between transport supply and demand, then the question, all the questions remain unanswered that we had so far on equitable access, um, on efficiency, on safe mobility. That's just not answered. So that argument wouldn't do it, although it's propagated in, in the literature. So whatever it needs, uh, sorry, whatever it is, it needs sustainability indices linked to mobility or uh, to the need for mobility, that is, access. And uh, one way of doing that is um, saying it's up to you to stop emissions. Here's your personal account. You can have an app on your phone that tells you how much CO2 ha you have used by your mobility choices today, etc., etc. That's not changing much. Uh, we can think of carrots and sticks. Um, uh, offsets are one way of, of doing so. I'm a bit critical about offsets because the proof is not yet done that they are working. Or we can think of planning and regulation. And that touches on uh, the idea of a 15-minute city that is a regulatory act of impacting on how we plan cities, how we build cities, or how we change cities. Uh, but then, if we want to do that, we do need tools, and here the spatial data science community is called, we do need tools that provide the evidence for arguing against what other people say is too difficult. So, how do we do that? Well, by spatial data analytics, by spatial data simulation, etc., etc. So, we will have a discussion afterwards. Um, I'm suggesting a couple of questions to think of, uh, start thinking of now to be prepared for that discussion. One is, what are the approaches that we as a community can suggest or provide for data analytics? That is the data, um, the approaches, and the challenges with the data and with the approaches. If we change accessibility, do we understand the system of opportun um, access to opportunity? Um, so can we produce the evidence of impact? Um, and uh, last question, since it is not spatial data science alone, how does spatial data science integrate with social, environmental, and economic science? Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next talk, which is a virtual talk by um, Martin. So I hope you can see uh, my slides again, and I will start his recorded lecture. Welcome, everyone. Uh, in my part of the session, I would like to uh, discuss what we can as spatial data scientists do. My name is Martin Tonko, and I'm from the University of Melbourne. So in a recent preview to um, our paper on this topic, um, reviewers said, our technical community cannot do justice to such socially important priorities. Leave us the math, geometry, and computer science with our algorithms and data structures while doing proper justice to climate impact in its own separate conference. And I find this a myopic approach to the problem. I believe that we, as social, uh, as spatial data scientists, are equally responsible for the results and impacts of our research as our medical professionals um, artificial intelligence researchers, environmentalists, and others. So I'm advocating for the conduct of responsible research. Not only responsible conduct of research, but the conduct of responsible research. The same way as medical professions conduct responsible research, 
where they attempt to do no harm, uh, and for instance, where they design clinical trials, they explicitly test the clinical effectiveness and efficiency of the uh, interventions they propose. Similar attempts are now happening in the machine learning community, uh, where scientists are asked to explicitly address the broader impacts of their work in statements in their papers. And in the ACM and computing community, the discussion has also been initiated primarily in the human computer interaction uh, sub community, uh, where a recent uh, paper by Hecht et al. Um, explicitly says that there is a massive gap between the real world impacts of computing research um, and, and what that research achieves, um, and that this represents a serious and embarrassing intellectual lapse. So, we as spatial scientists should equally carefully consider the motivation and impact of our work. So what am I advocating for? I am ultimately uh, advocating for a methodological transparency, both in the statement of the benefits of our research and in the statement of their costs. I'm asking us to consider how we could in our papers and in, our, in the presentations of our research, uh, contextualize benefits. Quantify the benefits of a proposed method in a meaningful context of the necessary reductions, let's say, of CO2, energy, and so on. So consider um, a computational model that somehow reduces the overall um, costs, path lengths, of all traffic uh, generated by mobility in a given city. Okay. I am suggesting that instead of saying um, that uh, we have come up with a method that significantly reduces travel path lengths and thus contributes to mitigating climate change, we provide a contextualized benefit statement. We provide a method optimizing travel in CDA um, um, that um, reduces the trip length by 5%, which equates to an X percent reduction in CO2 emissions equal to a Y percent uh, fraction that is necessary uh, of a target um, budget that we need to achieve uh, by a given date according to some scenario, maybe an IPCC scenario. Okay, and that would provide a context to the reader of the overall contribution of what we have achieved. Uh, in the cost uh, uh, part, I am suggesting that we are transparent about the costs of any methodological contribution we make. So, for example, uh, if our method is based on a machine learning model that needs to be trained uh, on a large amount of data and is expensive, has a large number of hyperparameters that require a lot of GPUs to be run for a long period of time, I'm suggesting we attempt to provide explicit information about the energy and CO2 emissions generated for training, possibly retraining, and running of the model. During the, uh, um, during the writing and, and then research uh, for the paper, but also if the model was to be deployed in practice, at least provide an estimate. Does a traffic optimizing machine learning model, such as we have proposed, uh, need to be retrained periodically? Um, can we try to transparently inform the readers how much CO2 will this cost? And is it somehow commensurate with the savings in the same time period um, uh, that we could achieve uh, in CTA? Will this costs of training the model emissions of the track. And finally, I would like us to also consider the opportunity costs. Uh, I'd like us to reflect on the opportunities that we would achieve um, and that might have a higher net benefit in the given context, uh, maybe by finding a simpler or alternative method and that would provide uh, the readers and decision makers with a perspective on uh, on the outcomes of what can be achieved. So consider do the benefits of reducing the CO2 emissions achieved by optimizing individual trips 
outweigh the benefits of avoiding these trips altogether, uh, possibly by using public transport. Are there any benchmark data or methods that you could reference and demonstrate, maybe generate a graph, uh, to put the uh, savings achievable by your models in the context? So, ultimately, what I am suggesting that we discuss is how we can still do our research, but not oversell. Can we be more targeted, transparent, and humble in our motivations? Can we do better in the interpretation of our results and their implications? And will this get us to think about our research a bit more before maybe engaging in it at all? Maybe it will get us to pick more meaningful topics to engage with. And as a silver lining, I believe that if we do all of that, we might end up with more impactful research. And I would like to, I'm sorry I will miss the discussion, but I'm sure it will come with some very interesting uh, comments. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, he is not here, but I think he also triggered some interesting um, ideas. I want to finish the statements of the organizers by just a few ideas about how to kind of structure this reflection process as Martin has uh, formulated and given some examples for. And I think we can borrow a principle, uh, the so-called free R principle from animal research. So there are some ethical uh, principles there that uh, people have to, to take into account uh, before designing an experiment. And uh, the idea is to re reflect the effects of um, an experiment, an animal experiment, uh, and um, find out uh, what is the research gain against um, uh, what uh, is the harm an experiment could induce. And um, in order to um, find out what possible options there are in order to have uh, less harm and most uh, impact, uh, there are these three principles, namely the replacement of an experiment um, by another one which is less harmful, the reduction of the scope of the experiment, or also a refinement of the experiments in order to bring it into a form that it has less harm and potentially more um, knowledge gain. So um, this framework helps to decide uh, which research could be conducted and how, and um, especially weigh this knowledge again against uh, the harm the research might cause. Um, there's a, a paper uh, from uh, the domain of environmental research where a fourth R has been added, namely refraining from a research uh, if it induces uh, excessive harm. So uh, what people can do is just look at such a simple scheme uh, where we have um, two axes with uh, the likely harm produced from little to much and the likely knowledge gain also from little to much. And then you try to ask yourself uh, what aspects does my planned research bring into that? And if there is, of course, um, a low harm that it would produce and a high knowledge gain, then we are in this upper corner of this matrix. And obviously this is a desirable research and can be conducted. Perhaps there might be some adaptations. So if we are in this upper corner, of course, that's okay. So little uh, harm except um, and, and medium um, knowledge gain that is acceptable research could perhaps be uh, tuned. But if we are in this lower right, then uh, obviously um, creating a lot of harm and uh, triggering only a little knowledge gain, such uh, a research should be refuted and not conducted. And if you are here in the, the middle where everything is kind of uh, waiting out each other, then this is at least suspect and should also be reconsidered. So such a simple scheme can bring us researchers to think about our research plans and also perhaps um, change them in order to be uh, to shift them to the lower left, uh, upper left. And uh, this could also be used um, in terms of evaluation of research. So if you are evaluating a research proposal or a, a research paper, that could also be used. 
Um, so what could be the guiding principles when evaluating um, knowledge gain against harm? Of course, we want to preserve and conserve our existing resources, not exploit them too much. We also want to um, sustainably use our existing equipment and materials. Uh, we should try to reuse existing resources again in order not to exploit the, the, the new ones. And um, if there is a, a kind of locational focus of research, then we could also try to limit the impact um, in time and space of the affected areas. And um, independent or, or more overarching is um, general principles of research, like um, optimizing the mobility for meetings and conferences, as Alex already has said. So um, this is just an idea of how to kind of make us think and uh, reflect about our research, not only about the knowledge gain, but also about the harm it might create. So uh, for the discussion, um, I just uh, compiled all the, the questions that have been raised in our presentations. I just have them here on the slide and um, perhaps you, you skim through them uh, in order to, to remember what kind of question you might uh, want to answer or even more uh, what kind of question you want to ask us. Uh, and I now invite you to, to get into discussion with us. Um, I soon move back to, to see you again because I only have my, my presentation here. Um, I want to invite you to ask your questions um, in the Q&A or to even raise your hand and speak in person. So we try to handle all your comments and all your statements and we are looking forward to your, um, to your input. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think I need the help of the hosts, but um, I think it's there. So as soon as you have a question, put it in the Q&A or raise your hand or also put it in the chat, but uh, we will compile everything. And Christoph has already put a question in the in the Q and A, um, <laughs> Gustav, I I would like to challenge that um, even families get smaller and smaller. Um, <laughs> the the cars haven't been small because in the past be, because the affordance wasn't there. The affordance of moving with the car was always there. Oh, okay. We don't have a two-way discussion. That means Christoph cannot speak. Well, I don't want to dictate the discussion. That's a strange situation. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We are open for thoughts, for um, ideas, for commitments, for um, offers for collaboration, for um, also for, co for complaints to the and... or for complaint. Yeah. <laughs> there was also a question um, if we provide our slides. Um, so I think uh, well, I, I can do that. Uh, I'm not speaking for my colleagues, of course, but sure. uh, I will make them available. So there's a question. How do we need to have a holistic global effort to achieve global goals? Arguably, same effort and energy investment would produce more meaningful results in some countries than other. So, um, Alex, is this a question for you? Sure. Um, I think it needs it, it. It needs a global effort. That is true, and I think that the countries that we are living in, those are the the ones who are mostly uh, called for taking effort because we are the ones having the the, the largest uh, footprints. We are also. Uh, causing footprints in other countries, for example, when we exploit their resources and their, their, um, their labor forces. 
for our uh, for our um, consumption needs or, or wishes. So, uh, and, and we are the ones who actually have also the financial resources, uh, or we could at least uh, redistribute our fin financial resources to make this effort. Uh, in poorer countries, also in countries with, uh, um, which are overpopulated, they are usually the ones that are, they have a, a large footprint, but not per, per capita. So uh, the countries with, that are most wealthy and have also uh, the, the best resources, they should go forward. They should reduce the, the footprints also of these dependent countries. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's basically on us. Um, and especially, for example, uh, the developed countries who, who like to be in the forefront, um, they could lead here as well and give an example how to do it and also to, uh, to show countries who would like to strive for the wealth that we are having uh, that this is, that this is uh, not, not a good uh, development uh, and help them also uh, in, a, in a better development for the future. Okay, we have another question from Francis. How is uncertainty to be accounted for in changing modes of access? For example, data collections from two years back may be outdated. Data collections for the next month may be un unusual in two years. So I think in that respect, I would not be so pessimistic because we have, um, I think what, what we do have now is an abundance of data. So we have um, data sources that uh, were not available um, in the past years and now they are there. So we could also take into account and use our analysis method to find out if the data still holds for the explaining the phenomenon that we are trying to, to observe. So, um, of course, this is a research question to take this into account and also make sure that um, that uh, the data that we are uh, collecting, looking at, are still representative for the phenomenon so that we can have uh, be on the safe side for prediction. But uh, Francis has a point, of course, when we look at the pandemic and what it did to urban mobility, then I would say that is not in the range of uncertainty. This was completely unforeseen. Yeah, um, I would also like to, to add to that. We also maybe need to, to question the data that we are collecting, especially when we when we look at transport. We have during the, the, the si since we are measuring transport, we are measuring motorized transport. And there's little known about the uh, about pedestrians, for example, of course, it's it's much more difficult to 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 measure their needs and and uh, what needs to be done to actually uh, make it make cities more accessible. When we're trying to analyze, for example, in the in the tool that I showed, uh, what is what is uh, in reach uh, for walking and cycling. Uh, we don't have actually the data that is needed to see if the, the daily um, activities can be pursued. We do not know what the types of, of workplaces are there and so on. So it's very difficult also to assess the, the accessibility. Um, so maybe we should also rethink what we are measuring um, and because what we measure becomes our master and we are trying to optimize what we measure. So we maybe should also question that. Okay, there's a question from Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've been encouraged to jump into this deep pool of very <laughs> stimulating points that people are making. And yes, but let's do it. I mean, it's nice to talk about it, but you know, let's get pointers. There's a chat here. Can somebody point us to a paper that talks about dealing with these challenges of data uncertainty? Can somebody point us to somebody who's resolved the problem of using data from 10 years ago and now is trying to figure out a way, a method to work with that data so that it can be reliably used to think about transportation where you have a lot more bicyclists fully and you have those kinds of changes, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not just talk about the, the verbiage about doing this, but let's actually do it. Okay. Good. So I, take um, I, didn't, 
and, and encouragement. And uh, should we move on to the next question, or is there another? I didn't I... get it fully. Can you can you just uh, sum it up for me? <laughs> so, what was the point? Yeah, I think the point was to to go ahead and and look at the data and see if it's really uh, reflecting what we want to okay. to observe uh, and not. Okay, so Lucas, uh, when uh, still measure accessibility in terms of travel time, the faster you can reach more places, the better. But it but is a place not more accessible if you have if you can get there happier or healthier, which is not always faster. Can SDS be used to quantify this. So uh, perhaps Stefan, you brought up the idea of indices and quantifying. Um, would you dare to answer on that question? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a challenge to answer unprepared. But uh, <laughs> the yes, so we do have a history in our community of researching routes that are uh, easier to find, routes that um, are providing shadow when the sun is shining or are providing open air when the weather is nice, etc., etc. We can do all that with tools at hand. Um, whether that will move people out of their cars and contribute to a greater uptake of active transport, I haven't seen research studying that. Well, we have uh, tried it uh, to to show people it, it's much much healthier and much nicer if you if you walk, if you cycle, and so on. But uh, somehow we don't get le uh, leverage by only showing people that this would be much healthier and nicer. Uh, I think it. What it really needs is, and of course, that's that's nothing that we as a researcher can um, can do is make a car uh, car trips a lot less comfortable, um, make it slower. So it needs both. It needs the carrot and the stick. Um, but what we can do as as data scientists, data analysis, uh, analytics, um, and researchers, we can show decision makers that if they really mean to reach the goals that they set themselves, uh, it needs exactly that. It needs the carrot and the stick. We need to make uh, motorized transport less comfortable. OK, I see a question uh, raised earlier by Anita. Um, and it says, um, concerning avoidance of experiments, if they do harm, uh, she claims that it seems to me that industry is experimenting on the population anyway. Won't it do more harm if academic research leaves this field to industry only? Yeah, I would, I would say that um, we should um, have this awareness and and uh, reflect uh, everything, and therefore also go perhaps be one step ahead of industry and try to be a model of, of what we should do and what we should not do. And I also would say that um, the, the, the researchers uh, from university are eventually also going to industry and take this attitude also with them. Of course, we should try to use also all information that is available and make use of it. But I think this is also a, um, an element of this reflection process. Perhaps since if the data is already there from industry, perhaps we could also tap on it and exploit it and, and make um, and draw the conclusions from that. But um, starting this reflection process is, is good and, and essential anyhow, I think. OK, are there more urgent questions? Otherwise, I think we are done with the session. So it's 12 o'clock um, if there are no more urgent questions, which I would still allow because it's it's very interesting. Um, I would perhaps give back to the host. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to Monica, Stefan, and Alexandro for this very exciting uh, uh, organizing this exciting session. It's indeed a very important talk topic uh, for our community. <laughs> uh, now it is uh, the time uh, we we would like to conclude this session. 
And uh, we would like to also remind the participants here, just in 15 minutes, we are going to have our first paper sessions. And see you all there. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, thank you.